Are you feeling self-doubt when it comes to government contracting? Are you unsure about which industry to choose, which sector? Does it all kind of look foreign to you? Or does it all look like, hey, there's opportunity here, opportunity there, opportunity all over the place? Well, stay tuned because this today's guest that we're interviewing with Mr. Pierce Robinson and Bryant Lynch, he was in that same situation. He came to us last year here at the GovCon Giants, and he reached out to us for help. And he was sort of a challenging person. So we sent them up to our resident expert, Mr. Pierce Robinson, also part of our GovCon Mafia. We sent him to Pierce to help him out. And fast forward to this year, we got this nice long email that states how much help we provided for him, inspiration, also helping him have clarity in his goals and his dreams. And so how he went from kind of lost in his journey and his path to having clarity and what business to go in and what direction to take. And long and behold, he received $800,000 in contracts over the next four years with DLA. And at the time of the email that he sent us, he had just won a previous contract 30 minutes prior to the email. And now he's saying he's went on back to back to back. And so I thought, wow, that's an incredible story. He thanked Pierce Robinson. And so I would be remiss if I didn't let Pierce sit down and do the interview. So you're going to hear today from Mr. Pierce Robinson, who's part of our what we call GovCon Mafia, because if you are familiar with the PayPal Mafia, which was Elon Musk, Reed Hoffman, and uh, Peter Till, right? They all helped start PayPal. And when PayPal was acquired, they all went off to start multi billion dollar businesses. And so I like to call our group Maria Martinez, Randy Ward, myself, and Pierce Robinson. You heard from Randy last week on our show. This week, you're going to hear from Pierce Robinson, who was part of that group where we were successfully able to pull down $18 million in contracts during the height of the pandemic. And so now we went off to basically come together and start helping people at scale, right, within our own specialties and our own sector. So stay tuned. This episode, super, super excited to, to hear from these two gentlemen. I'm looking forward to it. I haven't even heard it myself. So I just wanted to do the intro, welcome them, and I hope you enjoy it. Look forward to all the comments and welcome Mr. Pierce Robinson and Bryant Lynch. <sighs> Hello, GoCon family. Today we are sitting down with Mr. Lynch from Valley Solutions. A few months ago, we got on a call. We held a, a quick, if you call two hours quick, we held a quick meeting. And uh, since then, they've had tremendous success. But I don't want to stand there, steal their thunder or their glory. So I will let them introduce themselves and kind of talk about their company. And over the next hour, we'll talk about where they were um, when we first met them, where they've grown to now, and what the future looks like for their company and um, for Balance Solutions as a whole. So go ahead and take it away, Mr. Lynch. Sure. All right. So my name is Brian Lynch. I am the founder of Valen Solutions. And Valen Solutions started in 2014. And I was just a solo entrepreneur, IT guy, going out, getting different contracts and kind of just serving the uh, state and local government is what I was doing at the time. Um, I got to the point that I wanted to kind of expand outside of myself and get a crew. And um, along that journey, I met my partner in crime here, Miss Sierra. Hello. And um, she helped me basically expand it, if you will. So how we decided to expand it at first was we actually started as a uh, staffing agency. That was the first thing we did because she had an, um, an HR background and she was familiar with it. And I was like, look, let's just try to hire other people like me. So I'll go look for the, the talent and um, you know, she would do the HR duties. Well, that ended up burning me out because I ended up having to be a recruiter too. And I said, man, that's not gonna work. <laughs> so fast and forward, um until about uh november well i actually ended up switching back to just doing it again so fasting forward into um november of last year oh, and wait 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 you skipped oh. over. so how long did you guys do staffing before you're like hey this ain't it it was like a, you started in 2014 so did you do it for a year two years four years how long did you like year. we did it for like a year okay it was like a year we was on cyber security um staffing so we was looking for cyber security engineers architects and all that good stuff because i had a uh, i had a master's in cyber security so i already had knowledge of it and i had already had like eight well, well like the time probably like four five years of it experience and everything networking and all that good stuff so just trying to combine all my knowledge to create something good but like i said that didn't work for like a good fucking like year but we stuck in there though you know we're gonna get in strong for a year but um after that year we ended up, I had a couple of other little serialpreneur journeys. Um, I had a car renting business that only did electric car renting companies. That's it. 
I had um I did business credit, <laughs> like I was trying to teach people business credit and everything. It was a long journey. But end of the day, I ended up going back to my first love, which was IT. So um ended up doing IT again until like I said, November until about well, last year. I will say I was doing, like I said, I was doing IT state work for the longest. So I was already in the government space. So I will say between November of last year and prior, somewhere in there, I've already was doing research on doing business with the federal government, somewhere in there. This didn't really know exactly how, didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to at least do business with the federal government because I felt like that's the next step. You know, when you're doing state for so long, what's the next step? You know, so I was like, all right, federal government, that must be what it is. But I wasn't going to join the military. All right, so that wasn't going to happen. So, um, <laughs> so luckily, I end up, um, I grind videos, man. Like, I study hard. Like, when I'm really into something, like, I'm diving in and trying to find out where the resources are so I can learn what it is and how to do business with it or whatever. And um, I came across GovCon Giants on YouTube, um, as well as other uh, government contracting YouTube videos. And I try to look for to see who's really legitimate. You know, I, you can kind of see who's real by just listening to their conversation. One thing I like my, a lot about Eric and, and his crew is in the videos, he really kind of breaks things down in a sense to, to give me enough knowledge that, yeah, that's right. You know, like that, that, make, that makes a lot of sense, basically. So um, digging, in, uh, digging in a little deeper into it, um, let's see, GovCon Giants, did my studying on that, watched his videos, bought his course. Oh, no. Before I bought this course, I think I reached out to, um, I don't know what I reached out to get you. I don't know what I did to reach out to get you. I think I sent you an email. <laughs> no, uh, I think I think you ended up reaching out to the team. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think you might have engaged with the team once or twice. And um, from what I was told, you had some bad experiences. Um, <laughs> Um, they told me that you'd be a, a little bit difficult to deal with. <laughs> Slightly oh, difficult uh, to deal with. Yeah. So, I uh, Long email. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so they, they passed you off, and uh, and then from there we ended up having, I think, our first discussion, and 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 that's how we. Uh, well, I, I don't want to ruin it, but so I'll let you continue. But we had our first discussion, so I'll let you continue. <laughs> All right. So when I reached out to you guys, sent you a long, long email because I, I, me and her, was discussing and talking about it, just trying to find out what our next step was going to be. Um, we actually, I, I'm pretty sure she was in that, was you in that meeting? Yep, well, yes, she was. Yeah, I'm pretty sure yeah, she was. Yeah. <laughs> so when I sent you that email, whatever, it's not difficult to deal with, me and you set up it on, a, on that call. Now, when we had that call, just like everybody else, I had no clue what I wanted to do. Because I, I did do IT for many, many years, but I'll be honest, when it came to the service, I was burnt out. I've been, because... I did, yeah, I did IT and everything, but I was doing like three full-time jobs at the same time and building the business on the way up. So, you know, even though it looked like I only had at the time talking to him, probably like eight years of IT experience, but if you're doing three full-time jobs all the way up to all those three years, I mean, it adds up, man. So it, it really felt like I had more like 20 years of experience. That's kind of really how I felt. So um, when I talked to him, I was like, look, I don't want to do services, okay? I just want to do, I just want to, you know, do a quick flip. I just want to buy something, sell it, or whatever. I just want something quick. Like I don't, I don't want anything that's going to tie me in and dedicate me for twelve hours and all this and everything. Because how I, where I come from in the government contracting space, was you know you want a contract. You know you got three, six months, one month, one day, whatever it is. So once that's done, I'm done. I'm free. I'm good. <laughs> so I was like, I want to replicate that same thing in federal government. And Fairside told me straight up. He was like. I don't know what you're going to do, <laughs> basically. <laughs> it didn't really align with what they were trying to kind of say. But the one thing I love about Pierce in that conversation is he was, even though he did say that, and I don't remember the exact words he used, but in a, in a, in, in a way he was kind of like, I'm not really sure how that's going to work. But if you were going to do it, I would just do um, products and, products and uh, subscriptions. Or, or Yeah, products and software. That's what he said. And um, I was like, I don't really know much about that stuff, but but um, but I'll I'll think about it. I don't remember where in that conversation, but another highlight that I remember is that he had said he would tell me he would tell me how to do something, but I wouldn't listen, 
or I wouldn't do it. Do you remember what you said? <laughs> <laughs> you remember what you said? I, I do remember that. <laughs> so, so uh, for the for the listeners, um, at this moment in time, he is still very hesitant and he's a little jaded. So um, our, our our discussion actually went a lot longer than it was supposed to because there was a, there was an educational curve that had to come into play. But during that time frame, I was explaining it to him. And I could see the look of disbelief on his face. And I was like, look, I'm giving you these tools. You can use them or you can't. You're probably not going to use them, but it'll work out for you better if you do. But at the end of the day, you're your own person. And that was like the exact words that I used. So, that's right. But you used them. And that, that's how we got to this point. So continue. I did. So, um, so yeah, after the end of that discussion, granted, like I said, it was a long discussion. And there's no way I'm going to remember all the details in it because that was, we're talking last November, you know, we're in June right now, right? And ever since then, I just put my hard hat on and I went straight to grind mode. So every single day, I was looking for opportunities that was dealing with products. And um, I even questioned because a lot of people were saying, you know, staffing is like the best thing to kind of go in. And I was like, and I had, right before, I remember right before I got off the, the uh, call with you, I was like, you sure I shouldn't just do staffing? And yep. you looked at me there, what I say? <laughs> you saying if you want to get out of services, get out of services. Like don't just 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 don't mess with it. Cause it's gonna take you to manage people. I think that's what you said, something like that. And I said I didn't want to do that either. So um I was like, all right, I'm gonna give it a shot. So I was doing um I was looking at products because you had told me too that um the numbers or something, it was something about financially, it wouldn't. Um, I wasn't going to get the numbers I was looking for. Some, I don't remember the right words, but it was something along those lines. And um, so I was like, that's fine, because how I am, how I think, since I have all these other businesses, I've, I've noticed volume is what I kind of look for anyway, which, again, was against what you guys say, because you're more of a targeted approach. But I was like, that's cool. Let me let me just try to mix what y'all guys are saying and what my thoughts are and just try volume contract. Find a lot of contracts that's dealing with products. So started doing that. Got a little, that's, I mean, I enjoyed it though. You know, I got a little burnt out of it eventually. Um, and then I was like, okay, where are all these products coming from? And then I realized that the most solicitations are coming from DLA. And so there's some research on how to do business with DLA. Um, and that's and that's pretty much all she wrote. Once, uh, once I got my connection with DLA, took your advice for doing products and that was it. <laughs> that was it. Okay, now tell the listeners how much you were able to amass in contract winnings since you, you know, decided to go that route. We are right now, as of today, are at about 800K in sales. Well, I don't know right word to use it, but we had about 800K in contracts, should I say. Okay. And is that over one contract, two, three? How many contracts were won over the six-month period? It's about... Probably seven. Seven, nine, seven, nine, somewhere in there. So, between, <laughs> so, okay, okay. So, for everybody that didn't catch that, in six months, they've done seven to nine contracts totaling $800,000. So, it's doable, but one of the key things that he said earlier was he had to put in the work. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy, boy, boy. <laughs> That's so, true. <laughs> don't just get caught up on the numbers and then think like, hey, he made 800000 I can make 800000 There's a lot that's in this story that I'm pretty sure he doesn't want to share. He doesn't even want to think about because he has to <laughs> that work. And that consistency is what pays off. So at this point, this is your consistency paying off. But continue. Um, so at this point, you you won 800000 How did it feel when you got your first one? You was, like, at what point? Because it might not have been number one. It might not have been number two. At what point did you start thinking like, okay, this is viable. I should keep pushing this and moving the envelope forward. So first, <laughs> first, before I get to that, you mentioned consistency. So let me go ahead and back up on that. I skip a lot of things because I got a lot of things going on every day, all right? <laughs> so, but since he mentioned consistency, he's absolutely right. Because I was not really, because I also didn't mention this, I was already making um over six figures in my in doing services like I was I was making about 300,000 a year already before I even but I had to drop all that to learn the federal government space so that was a huge risk on my end and I was like look the only way I would make that risk is if I showed myself I can do I have 40 hours of work in my business consistently every single day at the bare minimum 
right? So what I would do is, is I created a routine in which I woke up at seven, mm -hmm. seven o'clock in the morning, every single morning, and I would not get off work until five. So I had to find work to do for me and her because she was on this journey with me. Yeah, I had to quit my nine to five. <laughs> do this stuff consistently every single day. There's not a day I'm not looking at opportunities, not a day I'm not talking to a manufacturer or a distributor or trying to create those relationships with the contract officers or something. There was not a day I was not doing it. I'm telling you that right now. And I also want to mention one last thing. The training was intense because we took the GovCon training. So the training on itself took about four months of just that training. And we do it full time. There, I don't know anyone who's going to complete that thing without at least three months. <laughs> I don't think it's possible. <laughs> so it took us four months every single day watching every single video one by one by one. <laughs> so consistency is key. <laughs> so I think the question was, what do you think the, the key factors that contributed to it? Is that what you had originally asked me? Well, I was asking, I was asking about um, when did you realize like, hey, this is viable. This is something that I, I can actually do. Um, this is something I want to continue to move forward with. When did you have that epiphany? Um, what was it on your first contract? When in your second, your third? At what point did you realize, hey, this is this is the way that I'm going forward? Oh, it was actually before I even went into the journey. So the pre-work. <laughs> <laughs> the pre-works when I realized that it's going to work. You know why? Because in business, you have to find your target audience. You have to know what they want, how they want it, and all this other stuff. The federal government gave me a contract that gave me all the information. I said, oh, that's easy to me. <laughs> this saved me a lot of hard work, all right? <laughs> so before I even started, and I seen, um, and you know, and all the preaching was saying that the federal government, you know, provides X, you know, X amount of dollars, um, trillions of dollars. I don't really know the exact number, but that was enough for me to be intrigued enough to dig into it to see what it really is. So mm -hmm. it sounds like there's a lot of money being thrown at small businesses such as myself. And I will also mention the, the contracts that I have won so far, maybe except for one, were all unrestricted. So there was no certifications whatsoever required for them, even though I do have certifications, but just something else I want to just kind of just say. but. That's my answer to that. Okay. All right. And um, you already said that you were consistent. So we know what factors kind of contributed. It was a consistency, the calling. And you said something that I think a lot of people might miss. You said from seven to five every day for a 40 hour week, you made sure that you had something to do. Um, I think that speaks volumes because a lot of people would be like, all right, I, I, I looked at Sam or I, you know, I talked to the contracting officer, I talked to two or three of them. I'm good. Like I got the rest <laughs> of my day. But the fact that you actually treated it like it, like it's a, a real job is part of the reason why I think you're able to move so fast in, in your journey. Um, it kind of comes back down to the, um, it's a it's a saying where people were talking to Kobe Bryant and Kobe Bryant was saying how he got so good. Um, Kobe Bryant was like, where most people go to practice once a day, I would go to practice three times a day. I would go to practice before practice at about six o'clock. Um, I think he said he would take a break at like seven, eat, go home. Um, relax. Then he would go back at noon and he would practice again. He'd come home, relax, and then he would practice that night. And he said over time, what would happen is where well, you're practicing once a day over that one summer, I've already beat you. He was like over at, at year two, I'm already at year four in practice. So I'll practice two more years than you. And then he was like, by year five, I'm, I've got you beat by five years. So I'm at 10 more years than you. And just compounding that consistency was one of the things that he said that made him great. And as you were talking about how you're able to get to that point, um, putting in that 40 hours consistently, consistently when there's nobody to come and, and look over your shoulder and tell you, hey, you need to execute on this. Um, that speaks to your discipline. So kudos on that, because most people would not do that for 40 hours. That's 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 very, very disciplined. So congratulations on that as well. Um, I'm glad that Kobe, too, because this whole journey, I kept telling him, I got that Kobe mentality, bro. Like, even though I said 40 hours, I was having definitely 60 80 hour weeks it's been ridiculous like i mean 15 hour days back to backs like it doesn't matter i gotta do what i gotta do but you got out of it what you put in there's not too many people that can say they've done that i think i've talked to i've talked to maybe one other company um so and it's an old one it's a uh making the giant so with maria i think she, it's american elevators so it's a company called american elevators they do at the time when we spoke to them they do four million a quarter 
And I remember when I first met with them, all she had was an idea. She was like, yeah, I got this idea for a touchless elevator. And I was like, hey, go do this, this, and this. And she was consistent the same way, super consistent with it. Went and followed up with the people I told her to follow up with. And uh, we didn't hear from her for a while. And I was like, oh, man, I wonder what happened. And then one day she popped up and she was like, hey, um, I want to say thank you for everything. I'm doing $4 million a quarter. And we were just like, a quarter? Most people can't even do that in a year. <laughs> So the consistency for everyone listening at home, it does pay off. And again, if you want to go listen to that episode for the ones at home, um, it's um, Making of a Giant podcast. Uh, Maria Martinez is hosting it, and she's interviewing American Elevators. So for anyone that wants to go back and check that out. But okay, so now that we have that out the way, can you share some of the strategies that you use to stand out from your competitors during the business process? Did you just go, hey, I'm going to be the lowest? Was it um, I'm packaging these services so I can get it to you faster? What did you do to set yourself apart since... As you stated, none of these were set aside that you actually won. Um, to kind of set apart, man, um, I think it's, to be honest, I think it's just my dedication to get it done. And when I'm realizing, it, it, does, it definitely seems like the federal government space is crowded. But once you're in it, it's not that deep. It's, it's, not, it's not that much competition as I thought it would be. So to kind of outbid the competition. So basically, all I did was... Uh, made sure I established those relationships with the manufacturers. Yes. Period. <laughs> period. All right. I have me some good. I still have really good contacts with the manufacturers. So with that, they give me extra juice and extra information that I need, so I can make sure I'm in the best position to get the best price for the product. Period. <laughs> so um, that's kind of the key thing. Like, throw it out. I'm gonna tell you, it's a deal registration. Get a deal registration on the product. <laughs> That's how you get the lowest price. Period. <laughs> okay, so repeat that again for, for those who didn't hear. Get a deal registration on the product so you can get the lowest price possible. <laughs> yeah. And another thing, too, you have to um, have, like, different automations in place. So you have to make your workflow more efficient and effective. So it's already enough you know, time that you have to allocate towards other things in the business by, you know, being a business owner and you have to make sure that that time is dedicated to, you know, certain areas. So anything that can be automated, you know, you can strategize and make sure that you can make the process more efficiently, seamlessly and effective. So that's another key thing. And that's what we did. So we have a lot of tools and different systems in place that help us, you know, speed up the process faster to make sure that we are getting more contracts and we're fulfilling those contracts within a timely fashion. So now you, you made, me, uh, made me think about something here. So I have a question. Um, I know this, but for everyone at home, how big is your team since you guys are using automations? It typically depends. Sometimes we have um, people who kind of step in and help us, like contractors, and then sometimes we have our family, sometimes we have volunteers, and then we, you know, have team. How big is our team? About five? Five, max. Yeah. Three to five. But, I mean, but when it comes to, and that's only because of execution. If yeah. it wasn't due to execution, it would just be me and her. The automations is a beast. <laughs> Shoot. Okay, so that means now what you stated is, is is something that a lot of people need to kind of like just take a moment to reflect on. You said with traditionally it's the two of you, but yeah, you guys plus up, you go up to five, and with five people in six months, you guys are able to accumulate eight hundred thousand dollars in contracts. Oh. Honestly, the the the, uh, the other people went until after we won the contract. So, <laughs> <laughs> truthfully, okay. So it's a team of two that, and you guys are able to scale that fast. All right. Yeah. So that's that's just for people at home to kind of sit back and think, like, because sometimes when you're doing you know entrepreneurship at in any form, not even just federal contracts, it's a lonely journey because you're you're mainly by yourself, or you know you might be able to talk your significant other into it, or that person that you might be dating or a friend into it, but. Traditionally, it's, it's a lonely journey. So just being able to hear that, hey, just with two people, we were able to accumulate this. I'm pretty sure that's um, that's news that somebody's going to hear and it's going to reinvigorate them on their journey. So that's why I wanted to highlight that piece. Um, now, I'll, and I have to 
say, you know, even when it came to like the logistics part, the packaging and properly labeling, we had to figure that out. You know, we would call different companies to see who can help us out, but nobody could help us out. So that's something we had to figure out on our own. Very lonely journey. <laughs> Very long. I'm glad I had a party because I've been beating my head against the wall as lonely as it's been trying to find help or support or whatever. They don't exist. You got to be your own support, your own help, your own planner, your own everything. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, it, I will say it's, it's a lonely journey if you're not around like-minded individuals. So okay. if you're around other people who are on that same journey, I think it helps you out a little bit more. But for most entrepreneurs, they're operating in a vacuum because you might be doing something that somebody else might not be doing, or you might be um, a, a little bit, a little bit outside the realm of what they consider a normal opportunity. So, for example, I know there are a lot of people that when I tell them, "Hey, you know, we do federal contracts," they're like, "What? What does that entail?" So it's it's literally a, a process where you have to say, "Well, we help small and medium-sized businesses win federal contracts." And then that's then I'm like, well, what does that entail? So it's it's really a can of worms because there's a lot of people who don't really understand that. Um, so it, it in those situations it becomes a little bit harder to find somebody to relate to because they don't know what you're exactly doing to relate to you. So they just kind of relate to you on a personal level. But with that being said, and, and now that we're talking about you know your successes and um, your team, and we know what your team was doing, I think um, the next question would be. So you guys have won um, your $800,000 in contracts. How are you guys going to use that to be able to grow or impact your business or to scale? So what, what's next now that you've done that? Because you're, you're, you're at seven figures pretty much. Like if, if we're doing the rounding, anything above five, we round it up. So pretty mm -hmm. much you guys in six months have made a um, million dollars. You're close to it at this point. You're 200,000 shot. Um, and we're in the fourth quarter of fiscal year, so we know the federal contracts are coming out because everybody's trying to get rid of the money before the new fiscal year. So there's a very high probability that before um, the start of the new fiscal year, you guys are going to clear a million dollars. So what are your future plans with that, and what are your future goals once you bring in that additional revenue? I'm glad you asked that because <laughs> it kind of goes back to the first part of the conversation when I first said, I just want to get in and get out, but now that I'm in it, I kind of see the... The, the kind of the need for me, from the knowledge that I have, and ain't that many people who have the knowledge, I kind of have to spread that knowledge. So I want to expand. Uh, I'll be honest with you. That's kind of been the goal. I want to, we're going to use the, the money. We're actually looking for staff now. We just had a meeting last week with about nine people who are interested to cover in different positions in the company. So we can go ahead and continue to grow. Um, so once that's all done, well and good, um, I kind of want to just kind of just speak, let people know, and uh, just make it more aware of federal government contracting and how people can get into it and how and how it can really change your life. It can change your life. It can change your company. If you really, really focus on it and you're really doing it, because a lot of people are solo entrepreneurs, and I've been that one for, for many, many years, and you kind of have to think of bigger deals. That's the only way you're going to spread, because the opportunity that's too big for you to do by yourself, that's, that's, that's going to force you to grow. So, and these companies, you know, you kind of have, someone has to grow. Like, I, I mean, that's kind of how it boils down to it. Like everybody just can't just be, you know, these, song, these small solo companies just trying to make it and do all the work themselves. End of the day, we got to pass our knowledge down to the next generation. So they can grow, they can get their own company, so they can get their own skill sets or whatever. Okay. Yeah. It's really, it's one of those things where if you don't know about it, how are you supposed to do it? So. We have like, you know, friends, family, everybody wants to retire. Nobody really wants to work for real. So how do you do it? You know, you have to put in the work. And if you don't know what to do, that's what we're here for. We're trying to get people to, you know, where we are and try to, you know, have more people to talk to because it is lonely at the top. And when you're trying to have conversations with people, you know, they just divert to something negative or when you're trying to like, hey, let's let's get this money or, you know, let's let's retire. Let's live this lifestyle that you want to live, that I want to live, that everybody wants to live. But, you know, when you have a conversation that just don't amount to that, it is kind of like, OK, well, let me go find people who are interested and like minded where, you know, I'm at so I can have those conversations, you know. 
And I will say, you know, as you get into a different space in your life, you don't forget the people that was there for you, but you kind of, you got to go on because a lot of people, if they don't have anything to lose, they don't care about what you got to lose. So, you know, conversations are just different. So I will say when it comes to things like that, um, something I used to always tell people is everybody's not going to see your vision because it's your vision. So mm-hmm. that's something that you you really have to keep in mind. But if you're talking to somebody and um, they aren't able to relate to what you're saying, they just can't see your vision. Um, and that's that's not a bad thing. Um, that means you might have thought of something that's very unique. Now, that does not mean that it's going to be successful. Because uh, if somebody out there who's thinking of something super crazy, they're like, you know what, that was the reassurance I needed. I don't want anybody saying Pierce said. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> within reason, a lot of people won't see your vision. And you have to be able to, you know, show them that, hey, this is a reality. This can be done. A lot of people don't. Yeah. Do and that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> so now that yeah. you guys are in that in that space, um, I would almost say the easiest way for you guys to, to transition would be uh, probably acting as a mentor or protege for other people who want to come into the space. So there's a lot of people who want to get into the space who want to sell products. And they want companies that they can partner with. And you guys would probably be able to work, I would say, most efficiently in that regard, especially since you do not want to manage people. <laughs> so <laughs> like, if you don't want to manage people, it's easier to work with another company and help them get all their, their infrastructure put in place for them to manage their own people. And you guys can still make your profit, still make your profit margins, and still be able to have that impact that you want to have without, you know, um, putting yourself out there and stretching yourself thin by having to manage multiple projects. So just, just food for thought. Because there's always going to be people who want to be mentored and who want to be looked at as a protege. So you can literally continue to do that and scale that way. Thank you, Paris. I actually needed that. <laughs> Thank you. And we'll make sure we uh, give GovCon giant our information of how you can get in touch with us. Okay. Hey, and what we'll do is uh, we'll put it, um, when we put this out, we'll put it in the, uh, in the clip notes of the video. So um, now be prepared. Um, a lot of people are going to reach out to you, so just, just be prepared. So you say you got automations in place, start putting them in place and making sure that you, you know, you have a, a CRM or some way to be able to track the people that reach out to you. Um, that way you can make sure you're engaging with them efficiently. Because once you start to build up that base and those people are reaching out to you, they're going to be coming to you with opportunities or stuff that they're looking at some of the time. And if you already know who to go through because you already have those connections, it makes it a lot easier for somebody to call you and say, hey, I have this opportunity. You say, hey, well, I know who to call. Let's work together on this. I can help you where you are where you need to do some heavy lifting at. And in that regard, you're still doing the same thing that you were doing before, but you're not dealing with managing as many people because that company is going to be self-sufficient enough to take care of itself. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So we know what your, your plan over the next six months to the year is. Um, now, so how how are you maintaining that rapport with your your I guess your manufacturers and your contracting officers? What are you doing to maintain that rapport? Are you calling and checking, making sure the product is working good? Are you calling and making sure that they they like what you sent? Like how is that rapport being maintained? What are you doing to maintain that on a regular basis? All right. So for the manufacturers and the distributors, uh, well, let's just do one at a time. So for the distributors. Um, I like to keep, they call me, just to be honest, they call me. <laughs> so after we brought them so many quotes and so many deals and stuff, um, they honestly created a different federal department for us to kind of handle all of our future um, products or whatever. So they literally built that strictly for us. And they, we actually had a point of contact over there. And um, she had told us, she's like, I hate to say it, I really love working with you guys, but they're moving you guys to a different department they're creating to kind of can't to cater to you guys' federal needs. I was like, oh man, that stinks. Because we really like them. So um we, we, she normally does all the communication stuff. I am not the one to converse really with many other people unless I got to. I'm like the last line. You don't want to talk to me. Okay. By the time you talk to me, it's probably something I'm probably frustrated. All right. You do not want to talk to me. I'm glad I'm, I'm happy on camera, but I promise you, when I'm in work mode, it's a whole different mode. All right. You don't, don't want to deal with me. <laughs> so but it, as you know, they said I'm hard to deal with or whatever. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a trick to it. But, um, <laughs> but uh, so she mainly does uh, all the communication with the uh, manufacturing distributors. But right now, I reach out to the contracting officers and make sure everything is good on their end. But we 
deliver something, we'll make sure they actually received it. So I try to keep that constant communication. And I also look for all opportunities right now. So I only look for opportunities, well, not only, but I mainly look for opportunities that I've already dealt with the contracting officer already. So we already had a rapport, we already had a relationship. So I'm just keep finding more opportunities that kind of align with what we offer, as well as what is one of their um, purchase requests. Okay, yeah. so I, I have a question now. So you said you're constantly looking at opportunities. Mm -hmm. and you know the contracting office. Why haven't you gotten a forecast list? I do have a forecast list. I do. I have a forecast list, but DLA's forecast list is a little funky. It's a little bit different. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit different for everybody else's. Everyone else's, you know, I download spreadsheet. We have to highlight the ones that we, that matter. Go ahead and do the capability briefing. Go ahead and talk to them about those opportunities. But DLA's forecast list is, I can't even explain it. It's different. <laughs> It's definitely different. Okay, now you did you did highlight something. Um, you, well, you mentioned something a second ago. You said you do your capability briefings. So, for uh, how many capability briefings did you do? Did you do a capability briefing for each contract that you won, or did you do it for one or two? How many capability briefings have you done over the past few months? We have not done any capability briefings yet. We have not done any yet at all. We're getting ready to schedule. That's the reason why I said the next six to 12, well, the next six months. Guaranteed happening because the first six months was training and learning how to bid and respond to proposals, respond to source aside. That took about, I was, let's just say that was the first six months. All right. So the next six months, we take everything that we learned and we applied. To be honest, the 800K was really in the past 45 days, to be honest, because that's when we really put our head down and started actually bidding on contracts because we're trying to apply what we learned. And once we got them, and then I guess we can say for the next 30 days after we won it, was learning how to fulfill it, making sure the package and receiving all the rest of that knowledge that we learned. This next six months is expansion, so we can go ahead and continue to, to get con well to source and look for contracts and, and um, source. I was to say source and look for contracts, and then after that, well, it's it's in a project uh, project planning. Okay, I can't remember it all off the top of my head, but I'm telling you now, capability briefings is part in networking with um, Ozzy Blues and everything. It's just the next section that we're getting ready to get into. See, I almost wore my Ozzy Blues shirt too. I almost wore the one Ozzy Blues shirt today. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was very close to wearing it, but I was like, ah, we'll, we'll go with the, we'll go with the classic. But- um, and I would say this too, Pierce, um, as it relates to, you know, uh, keeping in touch with the manufacturers and contracting officers too, there's certain parts that become obsolete, um, end of life, or they just simply upgrade or they change. So it's important that when you're doing products, you make sure that those parts, before you go get a deal registration or before you go get a quote, they're up to date because you don't want to, you know, get a part and then you submit it, the bid, and you find out that it's obsolete or end of life. And now you're in a mess. So you got to figure out how to get that part. You, you might not even get the contract fulfilled because now you got a problem with the federal government. So, and that's a whole nother thing because you don't want to get on that bad list. Yeah, that happens. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I was like, uh, that's the easiest way to, to shut down whatever you're trying to do. Now, I do have a question. So I know there's, there's probably somebody listening. They're like, okay, they did 800,000 contracts. They were able to pull this off. And they're probably thinking, how were you able to, because um, some people face this challenge, how were you able to negotiate with your manufacturers for them to give you the product and trust you to sell it to the government? Were you Did you have to pay money up front? Were they okay with giving you a net 30, a net 45, a net 60? Um, how did you go about doing that to be able to, to get that product that you needed to be able to supply to the federal government? And can you kind of walk us through that challenge and how you solved it? Sure. So um, earlier in this conversation, I said I had a business credit company. <laughs> so the reason why is because I went myself, put my business through business credit. So I already had established business credit by the time I went on to the journey. So I probably had about a year and a half, if not two years of business credit already built up. So by the time I'm dealing with the manufacturer, I was able to um, give them a the reference, the credit reference and everything. Um, that's basically what I needed. So once I was able to submit them my credit references and everything, uh, they actually gave me net 30 accounts offer at least. Nice. And um, so, but the net 30 accounts really didn't cover one of the largest ones that we had so um, I was speaking to the manufacturer, talking talking to them uh, to our point of contract with the manufacturer 
point of contact with the manufacturer. I was speaking to them, and they were saying, I, this, I don't know if I'm supposed to repeat this or not, but he said, <laughs> We can edit that. We can edit it out. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, Contracts are like liquid gold. That's what he said. He said, As long as you have the contract and you want it, you bring it to us, we'll figure something out anyways. That, so, is, that is a, that's a very true statement. Um, that Well, and this is the reason why. So the reason behind that is they know the government's going to pay. Federal government is going to pay. And that's that's guaranteed. As long as you have the contract saying, hey, you know, we're working with this company. This is what we're going to pay you for. They know the money is coming. They just have to wait for it. So that, that is a very true statement. You can leverage your contracts to open some doors for you if you need to. But you have to have that contract. And I think that's, that's where a few people get caught up at. So um, it's been a few times. I think we've had one in the past few months as well. Where somebody reached out and they're like, hey, I got a contract. And they were trying to deal with uh, their manufacturer and distributor that was going to give them the product. And the contract turned out to be fake. Thankfully, they found out in advance. But yes, we've had, we've had a few times. Well, you know, you get you get cited. So you get somebody that's saying, hey, we, we accept your quote or something like that. You might have put like a $40,000 uh, buffer in there for yourself to be able to take home. So if you're like, hey, all I got to do is close this down and get $40,000. You're not thinking about anything else, but I'm about to make forty thousand, and and that becomes your focus. And I can tell you that from experience, <laughs> like I've I've been there before, where it was a large amount of money, and I was like, "Yo, this is it! Like this is what I'm gonna make." And yeah. you kind of lock out everything else. Um, so that's why it's always important to not get so caught up on the number because there are some large numbers out there, but you don't want to get caught up on that number. You really want to kind of take a step back. And look at the full picture and not just this is the amount that I'm going to take home when it's said and done because you can't get caught up in that process. But um, I do like the fact that you highlighted that you already had business credit. We have a, a process where we help people kind of build that up um, a little bit. So um, hearing that that was something that you used was great. And hearing that you're able to use the net 30, because I always tell people that I'm like, hey, um, and I, I might have told you that on our call. I was like, hey, man, if you can go get you like a net 30, net 45, net 60. If you can push it to a net 60, at that point, if you're supplying the government with software, you're not doing anything out of pocket. Because they're going to they're gonna give them the product. And you know within those two months, maybe 45 days at the most, it's going to hit your account. So now you you sold the product and you made the money back without taking anything out of your pocket. And that's one of the benefits of being able to have that business credit. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that you already had that and you're able to overcome that challenge, that hurdle that most people hit. But other than that, um, is there anything that you would like to you or Sierra would like to say to people who are coming into the space, people who are working in the current IT space, um, people who are thinking about it or future generation that might just be listening to this podcast. Okay. Well, first thing, I do want to kind of piggyback on that um the the net the net accounts, net thirties, net sixty, and everything. Okay. Um, the crazy thing is, I I was doing I do state and federal, so probably in February we was actually kind of doing trying to get products for state contracts. And it was a big one. It was a huge one. And um, I was talking to the distributor and they were talking about financing and everything. And, and they really didn't think that I was actually going to be able to get in the conversation of this contract. But talked to the manufacturer, got a great rapport and a great relationship with them. They actually ended up putting me on what they call a master contract or something like that. Um, and the contract was for 15,000 computers. So it ended up being a about a six six or seven million dollar deal that I wasn't supposed to, I didn't know I was supposed to be in. I'm just crazy enough to like, wait, I'm going for whatever deal was talking about products. Like I'm going for whatever. I don't care. <laughs> so the craziest thing was when they gave me a quote back from it, because I actually had to go to the manufacturer first and the manufacturer put in on my behalf a quote to our distributor. And then we then we got our quote back. And it was a four, about a four or five million dollar net 30 quote. So that lets me know that's with the power of business credit. So I, I my stuff is no by no means perfect. And at that time, I only had like a year of business credit, to be honest. It, it wasn't a whole lot. So, but the backing of the contract is what allowed me to get a net 30 for four million, not four or five million dollars, whatever it was. Um, but getting into it, um, I am not a relationship person. I am not. And I'm going to tell you, that's not going to work. <laughs> you got to you gotta build relationships with 
whomever, um, whoever the client is, like if it's the manufacturer, distributors, whatever, you got to build those relationships. There's really no way really around it. I tried. I, I promise. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> there, there isn't. I tried to be a ghost and not talk to nobody if I, and try to pass them on to her, but she only knew but so much. So I knew the rest of the knowledge. Like, crap, I got to talk. So there ain't no way around it. I'm an introvert. And I still had to talk. And here I am today talking to y'all. So there's that. <laughs> You're not alone. You're not alone. I think uh, I think this is maybe like the second or third time I've actually done a podcast where um, I'm on camera. So you're not alone. Now, I will say this, though, um, for beneficial purposes for anybody that's listening or watching, if you're not willing to pick up the phone and make those phone calls and actually reach out to people, you're probably not going to make it far in federal contracting. Being able to and picking up a phone isn't the end all be all. You actually want to go and meet and shake hands in person. Um, we we kind of we kind of get, were able to get over with COVID hit because everybody's working from home. So mm-hmm. those those interactions were reduced to Zooms and phone calls, and people got used to that. It's too easy to set up a Zoom or set up a phone call with somebody, but certain people don't even want to make phone calls. But now that we're going back to you know more meetings and and more in-person things, um, I would say your best bet is to probably go out and network and shake hands. Um, I, I call it shaking hands and kissing babies. <laughs> so yeah, you right. go out, you know, <laughs> you shake hands, you, you kind of introduce yourself, talk about your company. And that's the easiest way to do it because there are certain people who, they're not going to pick up their phone when you call them because they're doing business the same way that you're doing business. And the same way that you're focused on trying to get business, they're focused on trying to get business. So that is something that I think um, is a big difference maker when it comes to working in the federal arena. If you aren't willing to make those phone calls, if you aren't willing to show up, then yeah, you're not going to make it far. So the fact that you were able to realize that is also a contributing factor to your success. Because there are um, there are a few people who are probably listening to this right now like, man, I know I need to make the call, but I don't want to make the call. And I'm telling you from experience, make the call. So um, sidebar, there was an opportunity that I just uh, put in for yesterday. Um, it is a sizable opportunity and I had everything that I needed except for one person, one person. And I was like, man, I got to find this person and I'm going to be completely transparent. I went on Google and went to call (laughs) from Monday all the way to about Friday, just dialing, dialing, dialing. And, you know, I I kept calling and, and doing my research or whatever like that. And I was able to find a company and Thankfully, um, I was able to go and do that research because the research that I did allowed me to find a company that was perfectly suited for the opportunity. So when we did our presentation, um, the contracting officer was thoroughly impressed. And they were like, yeah, you know, this is just one of the good ones. And I was like, okay, <laughs> cool. hey, man, look, it, it, when you start getting compliments from contracting officer, that lets you know you made it to the next phase. So um, that's, that just comes back to, you know, being able to make that call. Just like when I get off this call with you guys and, and we finish this, I, I'm going to go make more calls. So. Thing. <laughs> you know, like it's all about getting out there, making those calls, um, and just building that rapport because you never know who knows who. Um, there's uh, multiple people that I've met where I'm like, this doesn't work for me, but I know somebody that this can work for. And just off making those connections, you also strengthen yourself because off of making that connection, you never know what they might have down the pipeline or, or what might come down for them. And they might be like, you know what? They helped me out with this. I know they do something this arena. Let me hand that back to them. So you always want to kind of keep that in mind um, when, when you're reaching out, even if it's something that doesn't apply to you. Like I, I post a lot of stuff on um, on LinkedIn, on, on the LinkedIn, and a lot of stuff does not apply to me, but I know it benefits the community and giving back to the community, that community will give back to you. But with that being said, um, since we both have things to do and we're almost at our hour point, um, is there anything that you would like to say to the community prior to us um, ending this podcast session? Um, if so, feel free to say it. If not, um, we can end it here and, and adjourn. I would just say, you know, don't give up. It's definitely challenging. It's definitely a lot to learn. But if we can do it, you can do it. Because like I said, I actually quit my nine to five. I was in HR. We do like contract solicitations. I'm like, what? Like, I don't, I know HR. That's all I know. I don't know nothing about them contracts. Yeah, we do background reports and stuff, but that ain't a contract. So, you know, just make sure that if it's something that you're willing to do, you want to do, just put your mind to it. 
put your head down, you know, you got resources, you got GovCon, you have us, and I'm sure there's other companies out there that can help just, you know, make sure you do your, your fact checks and then make sure you do your research because everybody's not legitimate. But um, I just said, if you want to do it, go for it. That's right. Go for it. And at the end of the day, me getting rid of my 200K a year job was great. It was <laughs> wonderful. But um, I didn't feel like I was fulfilling my purpose. So, and I was doing a bunch of crap I didn't want to do anyways. So if I didn't want to do it then, I was like, look, I'm as well not do things I don't want to do for myself. You know, instead of doing things I don't want to do for somebody else. So it was a decision I made and I don't, I don't regret it. I don't regret it at all. Clearly, because AMK <laughs> contract in six months. So <laughs> well, you said you guys made 800 k in 45 days. So um, yeah. I'm pretty sure at that point you you don't regret it. <laughs> yeah. you yeah. made no, more but, <laughs> but you you made it through the valley the, the valley of death where most people are like ah you know i don't want to do this and you didn't get a shiny object syndrome so i commend you on that too there's a lot of people that go through the process and you're like you know what this is not working as fast as i would like it to i'm it gonna do this. <laughs> yeah yeah it's it, it, all it's never on time. your time, Definitely it, time. Yeah, it will always be, uh, it'll be when the time is right. It's not when you want it to happen, unfortunately, when it comes to federal contracting. But I, I, I firmly believe that's a huge benefit because if it happened when we wanted it to happen, that means as soon as you complete the course, so as soon as you sign up, you're like, hey, there's a contract coming. And yep. anybody who's been doing contracts for a while knows getting the contract is the easy part. It's actually the execution behind it that's the hard part. Because most people think, all right, contract equals money. And it's like, no, it's contract execution then like yeah. <laughs> so that execution point is is a, a very uh a very sticky point for a lot of people because once you like you said you had to figure out how to package that intended nobody told you and you can't call the contract off because they're like i gave you the contract do i need to take it back and you don't want that to happen so you're like all right it's crunch time i have to figure this out so i think with knowing that it's always a good thing that you don't get that contract immediately, that it comes when you need it. So with the example that I mentioned earlier, that contract, and I, I remember I used to get so angry at Eric about this. So that contract that we were looking at, um, it was something similar to your to your business credit. Um, the contract was for 70 million. So the contract was for 70 million. The walk away from that contract was sizable. So it was sizable enough where I was going like lead. So I was gonna walk away with like seven figures. It's off one contract. There was a contract we put together in a week, <laughs> like a team of five. So it was uh, Maria Martinez, myself, Eric, uh, Brandon Coffey, and Randy Ward. And we all came together and, and we, we were doing this thing. And I remember I was like, all right, cool. Like, I'm going to get this contract. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll share with everyone. So I was super happy. So you know how on when you're in middle school and high school, you have a really nice outfit for the first day of school. You know that excitement <laughs> that you feel where you're like, yeah. So Get out. <laughs> that was the excitement that I felt when I was like, we pulled this off. I remember, and Eric makes fun of me to this day. I remember we were on the call. It was like midnight. So we're on the call with the contracting officer for it. We were doing the contract with the state. So we're on the phone with the contracting officer for the state and we're on the phone with the finance people. And the contracting officer for the state goes, look, I'm trying to pull this deal off. What do I need to do on my end to get this deal done? This is a contracting officer. <laughs> so I'm like, this is done. It's a done deal. I'm super yeah. I get off the call. I'm up all night. I don't go to sleep until like seven. You know what I was up doing? I'm looking at houses. I was like, yo, I'm looking at houses. <laughs> I have one. So I'm looking at houses. I fall asleep at seven. Keep, keep in mind, first day of school, because you're thinking like, oh, yeah, I got that. Right. right. I wake up, uh, luckily, and, and I say luckily, even though I, at the time I hated it, the deal had fell through. So you wake up two hours later, because during this time frame, we were working around the clock. We were doing about 20 to 23 hour days, just killing it. But mm -hmm. during this time frame, we also made like 17 million in two weeks. So we're, we're going through the motion, just knocking out the park. And um, I remember Eric calls me, he goes, yeah, man, the deal fell apart. I was like, what? It's like, nah, the deal, the deal didn't fall apart. And you know how your friends try to console you. Eric was trying to console me. He goes, nah, man, be happy the deal fell apart because if it would have went through, you wouldn't know what to do with all that money. 
That, that is a problem that I want. <laughs> what are you talking about? That is a problem that I really want. I need enough to be like, I don't know what to do with all of this. That's not a bad problem. That is the exact opposite of the problem that most people do. But in hindsight, I'm I'm grateful that it did fall apart because if it would have fell what if it would have went through, I would have continued down that path and I wouldn't have been able to kind of branch out and, and look at some of the things that I'm looking at now. And I as I look at it, I'm like, okay. Yeah, I would have did that and I would have gotten, you know, that amount, but the stuff that I'm looking at doing now is significantly more. So it's like, you know what? I see why that happened that way. But this stuff that's going on right now in the space that I'm in now is a lot better. So it's always one of those good things where you might look at it as this door is closed, but there's a window open somewhere. You just got to walk down the hallway to get to it. Um, but with that said, um, thank you for your time. I'm going to put your information in the in the description. That way people can reach out to you. Make sure you guys have a CRM together. Sierra, um, you're the automation expert. We got it. So we got talking. it. So that's going to be on you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and for anybody listening or watching at home, feel free to reach out to them. They are a great IT resource, um, especially when it comes to products and services. Um, they do have a bit of a background in staffing. That's not their strong point. As you've heard them say, that it's, they don't want to manage people. So don't call them and be like, hey, I got this staffing thing that I'm trying to do. But if you're looking at products and services, they will be a great resource for you guys. With that being said, thank you for tuning in to the GovCon Giants podcast and have a great day. Thank you for having us. See you.